بسم الله والحمد لله حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه حمدا يليق بجلال وجهه وبعظيم سلطانه وصلى الله على خير خلقه محمد الصادق الامين المبعوث رحمه للعالمين وعلى اله الطيبين الطاهرين وعلى اصحابه الغر الميامين ومن تبعهم باحسان الى يوم الدين اللهم اكتبنا منهم اللهم افتح مسامع قلوبنا لذكرك اللهم اني ضعيف فقوي في رضاك ضعفي وخذ الى الخير بناصيتي واجعل الاسلام منتهى ردائي اللهم اني ضعيف فقوني واني ذليل فعزني فاني فقير فارزقني واغنني امين ما الله سبحانه وتعالى اوبن the hearing channels of our hearts to his remembrance to his words and impress in our hearts the true meaning the one that trans uh, the one that changes the hearts to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves and is pleased with which is transformational we declare our bankruptcy in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to take us by our forelocks to where he is pleased with us we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to honor us in spite of our actions which lead us to disgrace that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala look at our poverty our spiritual poverty and enrich us and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala remove us from misguidance and bring us into guidance and the best guidance is the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the teachings and explanation of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam so as we have just Uh, summarized that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes the oath of noon and on the qalam and testifies to the sanctity of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and his sanity that all the accusations that were made against him are false and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about and certifies that Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is on the highest pedestal of good akhlaq okay anybody can tell you you know people compliment each other you are so generous you are so kind you are so helpful and you feel good about it now imagine if Allah tells you that you are the best in of all, in all characteristics how reassuring it must have been for Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam especially with all the accusations and insinuations that were being made against him and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to say that you will come to know soon and they will also come to know who is the maftoon who is the one who is truly insane and Allah knows those who are who have deviated from the right path and those who are on the right guidance next ayah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says فَلَا تُطِعِ الْمُكَذِّبِينَ Therefore, do not obey, do not follow those who are liars, those who deny the truth, those who deny Allah, those who deny the, the kalam of Allah, those who deny the akhira, because those are the main things that are going on the theme at this time. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, do not obey them. Now, Did the Prophet ﷺ obey them? No, he was not obeying them. And as we said, it's always to be translated for us. This is not just a kalam for 1400 years. He's telling the Prophet ﷺ, do not obey these people who deny. So in today's application, not only does it mean that when you come across people who deny, who ridicule Islam, you do not obey them, you do not Uh, support them in any way you do not befriend them you do not have any resemblance with 
these people and their character traits. Okay? Because you will be identified on the Day of Judgment with the kind of people you kept company with. Okay? So, these are the people who denied the truth, such as Abu Jahl, such as Al-Ikhnas ibn Shariq, such as Al-Walid ibn Al-Mughira, and we talked about that. And these are people who knew the truth. I think I told you last time the story of at night they used to go and listen. Did I tell you that last time? Yeah. Yeah. They used to listen. And they used to tell each other they are not going to come. Yet they used to go because it, the words were so powerful. And their logic was that if we give them this, accept this message, then this branch of Abdul Manaf will take precedence over us because we cannot bring a prophet to match. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, and telling the Prophet ﷺ, do not obey them. He says, Should not obey them because they wish. Wadda, waddu means they love, they desire that you tudhinu, that you compromise. So, for yudhinu, then they will compromise. In other words, they have no principles. They have no true belief. They are willing to compromise their belief. So they want to make a deal with you. Okay? And the deals were offered to the Prophet ﷺ early on, as some of you might remember. You know, they came to the Prophet, ﷺ, they came to him, he didn't listen. They went to his guardian and uncle, Abu Talib, who was the chief of this branch of Banu Hashim. And said, you know, tell your nephew. They came as a group of people of the leaders, about 10, 15 of them, among which was Abu Jahl and, and Utba and Shaiba and all of these people, Al-Walid. Uh, and they came and they said, tell your nephew, don't sort of uh, say anything derogatory about our gods. So make a deal. So the Prophet ﷺ continued his Dawah. His dawah is not focused on, you know, sort of calling names to their gods, but the dawah of Tawheed, calling them away from that to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then they saw one day the Prophet ﷺ making tawaf. So some of them came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, Look, we have no problem. You have been, you are born here. You are well respected, you are honorable, let's do this. You worship our God and we worship your God. So there is no problem, this is compromise. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed when this proposal was made of compromise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed which surah? Qul ya ayyuhal kafirun, la abdu ma ta'abun. That tell them that you worship your God. I worship my God. You won't worship mine, I won't worship it. That's it. For you is your deen, for me is my deen. So that didn't work. Then they went back to Abu, Jahl, uh, to Abu Talib <coughs> and said to him, that, look, you're not stopping your nephew. If you don't stop him because he's causing problems for us, then we will do whatever it takes to stop him. Now this was a threat. So Abu Talib, old man, he calls Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, nephew, in my old age, why do you want to get me into trouble? I love you, I support you, but I am from them. And he continued to worship what they were worshipping. But, uh, so why don't you back off, essentially? Stop. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in response to that proposal, made that famous statement that my uncle, if they were to put the sun in my right hand and the moon in my left hand, you know, I would not give up my dawah. Okay. Then they approached the Prophet ﷺ again and uh, uh, Utba bin Arabiya came and said, uh, let's do this. If you are looking for recognition, we will make you the leader of Makkah. If you are looking for wealth, we will give enough money that you will become the richest among us. If you want to be a king, we will make you king of Makkah. And in some narrations, if you are looking for 
women, we will get, get you the best women of Makkah to be your wives. And of course, the Prophet ﷺ had only one answer, that I have one message. Then one of them came to the Prophet ﷺ with the same thing, in response to which the Prophet ﷺ recited Surah Sajda. And Utbah bin Rabia came that time. He was one of the leaders. He said to the Prophet ﷺ, same thing, you are an honorable man. You're causing difficulties. Uh, let us compromise. The Prophet ﷺ, when he had finished all of his offerings, including the offerings like, you worship, we will worship our gods one year, you will worship. When he denied that, he said, okay, you worship, we'll worship your God 11 months, we'll, you can worship our God <laughs> one month. We'll worship your gods 364 days, you worship one God. You're making deals because they have no principles, no real faith. So the Prophet ﷺ denies all of that and when he was finished all of his offering, the Prophet ﷺ read to him, recited to him, Surah Sajda, Alif Lam Mim Sajda and when it came to, according to some narrations, at the end of the 13th ayah, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that, and if you don't accept, then be sure that the adab that came to Ad and Thamud will come to you. And at that, according to some narrators, Utba put his hands on the mouth of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa because he got afraid. He said, don't say anymore. And he went back. And the people said to him, you know, your face has changed when you've come back. He said, I have heard something that I have never heard before. Because we should read this at some point, it's very powerful ayahs. And he said, my advice to you is, leave him alone. If the other Arabs want to come and kill him, his blood is not in your hands, your problem is solved. But if he's a true prophet, then we'll be in good condition. But they did not listen to him. So this is the kind of compromise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that do not compromise. And this compromise comes back to us. Because today, people want Muslims to compromise their principles, be flexible. And sometimes, because of the situation we are in in the world of weakness, and people are compromising, you know, who said, well, biggest support comes for the Muslim from such and such group and such and such group. And those groups may be on complete sin and complete misguidance. And we want to partner with them and we want to support them. So you have to understand that there are unacceptable compromises because there are constants in our deen. We cannot compromise the tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We cannot compromise the risala of Rasulullah We cannot compromise what is right and wrong. Halal and haram. We cannot compromise good akhlaq. I mean, these are constant. Truthfulness will remain truthfulness is part of our deen. Tawheed is part of our deen. Justice is part of our deen. So we cannot compromise any of these just because we want support of another group because we think it will give us strength. How much strength can a group give you when you are compromising what Allah has sent you? Okay, just remember that. So, the Prophet ﷺ is ta told to preach clearly, openly, and convey the truth and denounce the opposite. So, we should not make any compromises today to get support from other groups and to fit in as open-minded and liberal and, quote, moderate Muslims, okay? We are always moderate, but we cannot compromise our principles, the constants of our deen. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تُتِعْ كُلَّ حَلَّا فٍ مَهِينٍ And do not obey, do not follow حَلَّاف the word halaf means somebody who constantly takes an oath. Wallahi, you know, by Allah, I swear by Allah, you know, always taking an oath and swearing. Okay. 
Why does a person constantly have to swear? You go to a store in any of the Muslim countries, they're selling you, Wallahi, this is the way, Wallahi, Ladeem, this is this, wall. Allah in everything. Why do they have to do that? Wallahi, I am not making one penny on this at this price. The person who has to swear all the time because he's a liar and people see that. So now he's trying to show that. Okay, they cheat, cheat people, which is a major sin and make it even worse by bringing Allah and swearing on that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, do not obey these halaf who swear all the time. Hilf means an oath, who take, take an oath. Maheen, maheen, halaf in maheen means someone who is despicable, who is base, who has no principles, who would sell anyone, he would sell his soul for something, for the right price. He is a low life. If you see, who has no real aspiration, that people who have no good aspirations in life, and we are not talking about wealth, we are talking about good character and things like that, who can be easily bought and sold, who have no principles. He says, do not follow people like that. So now we are starting here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one after the other. He's talked about the, the, the idol, ideal character, which is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Now he is presenting to us the opposite characteristics. Okay. That's what you should aim for, to be like Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And I don't want you to be like these people. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala defines nine different character traits, one after another, which are ugly traits from which you should keep a distance. And these are traits which we have to, again, look within ourselves that do I have some of these traits? Okay. Uh, we may have them, we might have one of them, we may have a trace of it. I mean, you do not, if you do some of those character, have at some of, sometimes, then we do have that character trait which we need to get rid of. So we've mentioned too, this person who is a liar and takes oath, who is dishonorable, who has no principle, bought and sold easily. And when we have these traits, which Allah has called despicable, we should also, when you choose a leader, what should you look for? What should you look for? That they do not have these character traits. When you choose a teacher or a sheikh, you should make sure they don't have these character traits, no matter how much they know. Because Allah has condemned these traits. So we have to look at all of those things. And of course, we shouldn't have them ourselves. Okay. And therefore, when we choose, whether we choose leader of a country, we choose leader of a society, or choose, choose leader of the masjid, make sure that they don't have these traits. Who we learn from, they don't have these traits. Who we listen to as preachers, they do not have these traits. And in today's world, it also applies in blogs and in websites and all of those things that people put in their profiles and posts, that it should not have any of these characteristics if the person is to be considered worthy of even listening to. Okay. So, we have to use filters of haya. Does this person have haya? Is he truthful? Is he trustworthy? Is she has show justice? Uh, do they backbite? And all the time, you know, we have people who will come to you, you know, so and so, dark so, so and so is doing this, just as did this. You know what the Prophet Wasallam's attitude was? He told his companions, don't come and tell me anything negative about any of my companions. We are all human beings. We may have something. Don't tell me about it because I want to see and meet that person thinking good of him. Because once you tell me, you get tinged. You tell me something about him. Then even though it may not be the truth, but it, in my mind, I think of it, a person in that negative way. <laughs> so next trait that Allah mentions is, Hammazin mashaim binamim. Hammaz is the one and you know, kulli humaza. Remember, Hamaz is the one who slanders, who backbites, who speaks ill about people, who gossips. Okay. 
who prods. Mahmaz is a prod which you use for an animal who jabs at people. Okay. So Allah, Hamaz is the ultimate level of that, you know, the superlative, the one who always does that. But even a little bit of that is just as bad. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing the characteristic, the one who swears, who lies, who has no character, and who is a Hamaz, who talks badly about people. <coughs> Using words that are sharp and that are hurtful behind their back. That's called Hams. If you say things in front of people, that's called Lams. Okay. What is the importance of this? There is a hadith that tells us that people, the punishment of the grave is for people who do that. Remember? Anybody remember this hadith? The Prophet ﷺ is traveling and the camel starts to buck and he stops and people wonder what's going on. He said there is a grave here of two people who are undergoing punishment of the grave. And the animals know about it, so they are scared of what's going on. And he said, and there, it was not for, a ma for what people consider major, sh two things. They did not take care of their purity. They were careless with the urine of their clothes and their body. And two, they did not take care of the tongue. They were hamaz, used to slander. For this, there is punishment in the grave. The Prophet ﷺ said about this trait that no slanderer, backbiter will enter. لا يدخل الجنة Will not enter Jannah. This is such a big crime. And he, in one hadith, he talks about the best of you have these characteristics. And he's, then he said, and the worst of you have the characteristic of a Hamas. So, we should always remember, even if, if you see something negative in a person, you talk to that person with wisdom, with advice, at the right time, gently. You don't expose anybody's mistakes to others, even though they're making that. You see somebody drinking alcohol, you do not expose that. Because if you cover somebody's faults, Allah will cover your faults. Yet you don't condone it, you talk to that person because it's your job to advise them uh, privately. Masha bin Amin. Masha from Masha means to walk, roam around, means traveling all over the world bin Namim with Namima. Taking stories from one to the other to cause enmity. You know what he said about you? You know what she said about you? Making up to cause friendships to disappear and enmity to develop, okay? That is called namima. That's another one of the major sins. Gossip, malicious gossip. In that gathering, so-and-so said this about so-and-so, okay? Now you get it to the person and now you cause people to uh, become enemies and resentful and cause trouble between people. So this is another trait that Allah SWT mentioned. Manna illil khairi mu'atadin athim. Manna illil khair means one who obstructs goodness, acts of goodness. Somebody, remember, somebody is praying, he stops him from praying. Somebody is doing dhikr, he makes ridicule, stops him from doing. Somebody is giving charity, he stops him from doing that. Why do you have to? Somebody is cleaning the masjid, he said, well, why do you have to do this? They pay somebody to do it. Manna illil khair at different levels. Okay, it doesn't have to be, you know, stopping you from Islam. That's the ultimate. Stopping you from going for Hajj or for Umrah or, or something. That this one he prevents and hinders all good deeds. Ma'atadin means he is he exceeds all bounds. He is an aggressor, he transgresses, he attacks, he is outrageous, harming people physically, psychologically. That's called i'tada. So mu'atadin, who exceeds all bounds. Now, there are different levels of this. How do you transgress against people? Simple thing. There are four people waiting to get into the elevator. There is room for only four. And you cut in front and you get inside. That's after the transgression of somebody's right. 
And in Islam, we are entering the masjid. And you are on the left and you go in first. Without offering the person on your right to go in first. That's a form of after that. Okay. There is one samosa left. And you, you are hungry and you liked it. So you see someone going there and you go quicker and you say, let me clean this up. That's Atana. Lit small levels. This is where we have to start. Mu'atadin <coughs> Athim. <coughs> Athim means who is sinful. We also transgress against people with our tongues, not just physically. By saying things about them, by cursing people, you know. Lanatullahi and falana and so on and so forth. Now you must remember that sometimes the companions of the Prophet ﷺ came to him and said, Ya Rasulullah, when things got out, why don't you curse so and so, the enemies? And you know what the Prophet ﷺ said? He said, I was not sent as a la'an, a person who curses. I was sent as a rahmah. And he forbade cursing Abu Jahl after he was dead. Even Abu Jahl, his worst enemy, people started saying, he said, don't, I don't want you to curse him. You know why? Yes. Well, one thing is, Usmat Rizafa kuch honi sakta kung to gya jahanna. But like in, you see, Ikrima ibn Abu Jahl became a Muslim. Other relatives of Abu Jahl had become Muslim. If in front of them you curse some, your, his father or his brother, in his heart at least he will feel bad. So this is the feeling of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And it's not going to make change anything anyway. So just remember, we are not sent to curse people. We are sent to make dua for people. The Prophet ﷺ made dua for his enemies for their guidance. And this Mu'atadin Athim, this aggression go, can go all the way to torturing and killing people. Okay. And the word Athim is again a superlative of ism, ism, is sin, evil, criminal behavior, one who is a perpetual, who is known as a sinner. So don't be like that. Another character. Utullin ba'da dhalika zaneen. Utull. Utull means someone who has no manners, who is very crude, who is very rude, vicious. Uh, greedy, unwilling to accept the truth, who will fight you on, to the extent of being harsh. Otol is also used for somebody who uses excessive force to retaliate. In other words, this can be an individual person. Somebody said something to you and you come back at him with ten times more than that. He said some word that was harsh and now you start cursing him with all kinds of bad words. And this also happens in physical you know, as individuals and as nations, it's called disproportionate response. You know, we see this in the world today. Somebody sent one little thing and the whole country gets bombed. Disproportionate response. This is called otol. Vicious response. Because why should we remember that? Because two wrongs don't make a right. In mathematics, yes. Negative multiplied by negative becomes positive, right? But not in these. That's why elsewhere in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, good and evil are not equal. He said, dispel or repel evil by good. And therefore, those from whom, between whom you had enmity, with whom you had enmity will become your dearest friend. And in spite of all of these, and in spite, you know, having these traits, he is Zanim. Zanim is somebody who has an identifying characteristics, who is just known for something. And in this case, known because of his sinful behavior, known for his evil. 
And there is another meaning of zanim, which means someone of low birth. In other words, who, whose father is not known. That's another meaning of zanim. Now again, uh, some of the uh, Mufassirun have said that these characteristics were again mostly for addressing because the one who fits these was the same one, which is Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira. However, it can fit many other people and you don't have to have every one of these traits. And we have, to, so we can say that, well, this is for him. It's for us that we don't want any of these traits. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us why all of these are combined in some of these people. He says, Because he has mal and money, wealth and children, human resources, financial resources, power, position. He forgets or she forgets who gave this. Who gave this position? Who gave the wealth? Who gave the children? Which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this person attributes all of this to himself and instead of being grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ungrateful and he ridicules Allah's promises and his warnings. Remember what he said in the previous surahs also because of his mal and banan that I have? Well, these are stories of tales of the ancients, you know, that these are fables and he forgets that Allah is in charge of everything that the command of Allah is only kun so as we said that noon all it takes is one command from Allah and it will eliminate everything Allah will take can take everything away it's out of his wisdom he doesn't and we'll come to that later in the surah so one level of denial is to attribute everything to yourself. And this we have to look at ourselves. I have so many children. Who gave you? I have this honor and position in the community. Who gave you that Izza? I have power. I have been elected as president. I am the president of the country. Who gave you that power? I have wealth. I have health. I am this and I am this. I mean, here in we are taught to say, I am number one. Well, there is only one one. You have to remember that. That arrogance uh, is not good for us. We have to remember that all of this comes from Allah. So the one level is to attribute, you know, me. Just like Karun did when he was said to, you know, give some of what the wealth he had. He said, I am intelligent. It's because of my smartness that I have all of this wealth. Similarly, people who have power will say, look, I have my military might. <coughs> so, as Muslims, Alhamdulillah, we never deny this that all blessings are from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, there are lesser degrees where we could be uh, more affected, such as we can be ungrateful because we are not attentive to the blessings. We don't deny them, but we didn't realize the, all the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every day I wake up, I'm feeling healthy. I don't realize that the health is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I need to be grateful for. I have a roof every day over my hell, house, over my head, and I assume this is normal. I should have it. You know, I'm working. I go to work every day, I should have a roof. I should have clothes over me. So I am denying the blessings of Allah by not recognizing them. With my tongue, I'm not saying that this is not from Allah, but I'm not realizing. That's why the Prophet ﷺ taught us this dua in the morning and evening, the meaning of which is that whatever blessings that I woke up with, that I've reached this morning, you know, Every blessing that I have and every blessing that all of the makhluk creation of Allah has is from Allah alone. Like alhamdulillah, like shukr. If you say that in the morning, Ya Allah, as a, as a, as a generic thanks for it without counting everything, 
lakal hamd everything ma asbaha bi ni'matin whatever the ni'ma that i woke up to do is and for all of creation min allah wahdahu la sharika fa lakal hamd wa lakash shukr if you say that in the morning and evening you have fulfilled that right of showing gratitude even though you haven't thought of every single one so one of the things that gets people into trouble is having the blessings of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which are given as a fitna as a trial allah gives you blessing so that you may show gratitude but it may also the blessings if given like allah gives can take you away from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because you forget about him i have so much money i don't have to think about who i have so much power i don't have to think i'll do whatever i'm above that so because of the wealth and because of the human resources a person may feel arrogant may have self admiration look how good i am how smart i am you know how much i have and looks down on others which is kibr and again these are the leaders of makka which had these traits and it also applies to all people not just the leaders of makka as we are trying to say over and over again that we do not acknowledge sufficiently the blessings of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and sometimes we don't say with our tongues but in our own hearts we attribute things to the means that allah used to give us these things okay for example if i get a lot of money that allah meant for me but he used me as the means by making some business decision then i forget that this allah who made me do this i say look what a smart business decision i made so indirectly that's what happens you know and that's all the time this is a big test everything that happens must we have to look beyond you know our eyes have to go beyond where it is coming from you know my store is giving me so much no the store is not giving allah can give through he is giving you through the store but he'll give to allah is the one who's giving my health is not coming because i work in the gym 4 hours and i ride my bicycle 90 miles my health is get, coming because allah has given me that so it is good for us to exercise this every day everything you see i can see clearly mashallah the doctor did very good lasik surgery my glasses are gone allah wanted me to see clearly he used that person i remind myself consciously enough as an exercise till ultimately no matter what happens you don't have to to consciously it, you see allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in it behind it and once you become like that then you will have true gratitude you will truly feel because then you will feel everything is from allah you know your wife smiles at you say i must have said something good no this from allah everything has to be attributed to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says because of this uh, delusion that he has power and wealth and children and all idha tutla alayhi ayatuna qala asatirul awwalin same story that when our ayats are our verses are recited to him he says asatirul awwalin tales all stories you know where did you come up with these stories we are living in the 20th century we we've reached the moon we are landing on mars and you are talking about gardens in the heavens you are talking about horain you are talking about this and i mean who's just the other day somebody told me and then fortunately not a believer how can you be sure that there is life after that how are you so sure how do you know there is punishment and reward nobody has told us i said yes the one who created it has told us but that's the belief okay so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says when our ayat are recited allah's book is recited they a sound mind and a sound heart should immediately submit samana wa ta'ana this is what allah says this is the truth if there is a command for me i will do it if there is a prohibition for me i will observe that prohibition after describing these nine characteristics and why these may have come on because of the arrogance and delusion of wealth and power 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ultimately, سَنَسِمُهُ عَلَى الْخُرْطُومِ س means in the near future. There are two future words in used in Arabic. Sawfa. Sawfa means in the future, in the distant future. S when it precedes means in the near future. Sanasemuhu. We will brand him. Okay. Nasimu wasama means to mark, to brand. Like you brand the animal, you heat the mark in the fire and you put it on the pshh. We will brand him, this person who has these character traits, and forever. Alal khurtum. Khurtum is like the snout of a pig. For animal noses, the word khurtum is used. For human beings, the word used is what? Anf. Allah is talking about human beings. But he's saying we will brand him on his khurtum. So implied meaning is this man is like an animal, like a pig. He's like an animal. Because the nose, anf, has special significance. Even say in, in English language, we use the word like he had his nose up in the air. What does that mean? He was arrogant because this is a sign of... It's a sign of honor. Or I'm going to rub his nose in the dirt. Means I'm going to bring him down. So nose is a sign of honor. So on what he takes, arrogance and honor, on this, Allah first dishonors him by calling it khurtum. He said, I, where everybody sees it, I will put a mark on him. A mark to show that this is a criminal. Elsewhere in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also talks about the people that they will be known by the Marks on their faces. Okay. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that these criminals will be known so that they cannot hide after. This is on the day of Qiyamah. Now there is a, a change of scene. After giving this whole scene, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that these chieftains, these people of power, the power structure of Makkah, I have tried them. Balauna, like I have tried the people, it refers to people of the garden. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna balaunahum kama balauna ashab al janna. Ith aqsamu la yasrimunnaha musbihin wa la yastathnoon. That I, bala is means a trial, you know, to try people. Balau. Inna, indeed we have balaw nahum. We have tried these people of Makkah with a special blessing. What was that special blessing? Prophet. Ultimately is that, the sending revelation in Rasulullah Sallallahu But before that, they were honored because they were neighbors of the house of Allah, the Kaaba. The people used to come there. They were honored. It given them honor, given them power, given them wealth, given them children, all the same things, and then send them the greatest honor, which is sending them Rasulullah. So we tried them to see what their response would be, and you know what their response was. So it's, it's similar <coughs> to the story Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now refers to a people, Ashabul Jannah, people who had a garden. And the Mufassirun tell us that these were believers because you will see in the story later on that these people believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they were from the earlier Muwahidun, like maybe from the Bani Israel or from the Christians. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, tells us their story. I'll give you the summary of the story first and then we'll go into the details that the story is that there was a good man, and as we said, they were people who believed in Allah, who had a massive farm or garden with a lot of produce. And what he used to do is he used to take, when the harvest time came, enough for his family, enough for next year's cultivation, and the rest he would give to the poor. <coughs> and not only that, he would, when he had his people go and harvest the crops, he said, leave some there, so the poor people can come and take it themselves. 
So he was a generous man. Now he passed away. Next gen. So the boys get together. They said, our father was not making sound business decisions. That's a lot of wealth that is being wasted on these people, these uh, you know, poor people. We would do so much better if we took it all for ourselves and not give anything to anyone else. So they debated amongst themselves. There were one or two sort of voices that uh, disagreed. One of them we'll, we'll talk about suggested that that was not the right thing to do, but ultimately the majority and they decided that tomorrow, this time for harvest, we are going to go early. We are going to harvest the whole crop, leave nothing there for anyone, and we are not going to allow anybody in. And how much more profit we will have. This was the plan that they made. Nobody should come to know. Then they went to sleep after making this plan, this shura that they had. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in His infinite wisdom during the night sent a firestorm, lightning struck and the wind came. Everything harvest was gone, only black earth was left there. Next morning they get up, wake each other early Fajr time. Let's go early, let's go early before people come because they know it's harvest time. And they're hurrying along, you know, if we need to, we need to harvest quickly, quickly, quickly. And they're whispering to each other. They even said, we are not allowed to, to uh, allow a single poor person, you know, to, to come there. So they go hurry over there. They come to this black burnt out place. First response, uh, we took the wrong turn because it was some distance from where they lived. We must, this is not our land. This is not our land because we have gardens full of fruit and things. So the first response was, we lost our way. We came to the wrong place. And then they realized, no, the place is not wrong. This was our garden, and it's all gone. Now, they st because they were believers at this, you know, they made bad decisions, bad choices, but now they realize, now they start turning back. And so one of them who was said to them, look, I was telling you, oh, you should thank Allah, you should do dhikr of Allah SWT, you shouldn't take this attitude. Then they ultimately, they, then they blame each other, if you had done this and we had done this. And, and then finally they come with tawbah and adama, they ask Allah SWT, forgiveness saying that we have done wrong and maybe Allah will replace us with something, with the hope in Allah SWT. So this is the story that Allah SWT is saying that, look, I gave all these blessings to this family or these people, this is what they plan, the bad decisions that people make. And every bad decision has its consequences and this is what happened. And this has happened more than once. More than once an example like this is in the Quran, like we have a similar example somewhat with in Surah Kahf, which is slightly different, but the garden is mentioned in three different, three or four different places. You know, one with the rain gets washed away, one this one, one the people of the guy who had arrogance about it in Surah. So <clears throat> let's go over this, this one. So they said that uh, we will go in the morning and we will harvest this. He said, Aqsamu id Aqsamu, when they swore an oath to themselves. In the morning, in the subah time, we will harvest this whole garden. They did not make an exception, an alternate. They said, we are just going to do this. Now the Mufassirun have said they did not make an exception means two things. One is they did not say, inshallah. We are going to do this. Okay. The other understanding also, which makes sense, is they, didn't, they said, we will take it all ourselves, we'll not make an exception, okay, we'll give some to the poor. So this is the determination, the bad choices they made, because out of greed for more, denial of the rights of the poor, which they have rights, and making the bad choices, not recognizing that this whole thing is given to you by Allah SWT. So, فَطَافَ عَلَيْهَا طَائِفٌ مِنْ رَبِّكَ وَهُمْ نَائِمُونَ فَطَافَ you, You've just come from doing tawaf. طَافَ 
Fatafa went around this garden alayha ta'ifum one of these forces from your Lord like a tornado like a, it, like a fire that it let you know while wahum na'imun so they made all these plans and they said let's get some rest they are completely unaware what Allah has done what has happened there and they were sleeping we don't know what happens right so there is one scene they've got all these evil plans and the other end what they've planned for is completely wiped out فَأَصْبَحَتْ Kassarin, and the morning came as if it had been completely burnt and, and gone. Okay. فَتَنَادَوْ musbihin. تَنَادَوْ They called. So, must have gotten up pretty early with the excitement, you know. They didn't sleep till 10 o'clock, 4 o'clock. Come on, get up, wake up. They called each other quickly. Let's go, let's go. Musbihin, early in the morning. أَنِغْدُوا أَنِغْدُوا Let's go early. Ala harthikum <coughs> means to your <coughs> cultivation. The common Arabic is Urdu ila, go to. But here the word is ala because it's showing this is their arrogance. They think this is ours. Ala harthikum in kuntum sarim mean if you are the one who are sarim. Sarim means who is very resolute. If you you know if you're definite and resolute. Uh, Decisive, you've made this decision, let's go and execute it. We are very determined. And so they left يتخافتون, in khufia tones on the way they are talking to each other, whispering, so that nobody hears what their plan is. Okay, so all this is going on. And what are they saying? Miskin. We will not allow any miskin entry into this. It's all for us. Hmm? So this is no beggars allowed. And today we have signs somewhere saying no solicitation. Similarly, no poor people allowed here. You know, that's not something that Allah looks favorably on. You don't exclude people because of their wealth from certain things or their Solic poverty. Solicitors are not. Well, sometimes, you know, so, you know, asking. Soliciting means asking. Somebody may come and sometimes we do that. But there are other meanings of soliciting. But what I'm trying to say is, you know, sail. Anybody, don't allow anybody to come and ask. It's not allowed here. This is not the, the forum for it. Don't stop anyone. You can give them or you have a choice of not giving them. وَغَدَوْ عَلَىٰ حَرْدٍ قَادِرٍ غَدَوْ means they sent out, set out early. عَلَىٰ حَرْدٍ قَادِرٍ حَرْدٍ means with a very strong intention, determination made by a person who has power and capability. <coughs> and there is a, a intensity on it, the shidda, that they have... They, they have the force that we can implement what we have planned. Uh, <laughs> but when they saw the garden, they said, Inna la We have certainly gone astray, means we took the wrong, wrong exit. We have not, this is not our garden, it doesn't look anything. So the first response was that we have gone, lost our way, and we've come to the wrong garden. Next ayah, بَلْ نَحْنُ مَحْرُومُونَ No. One understanding is Allah is saying, no, they should say نَحْنُ مَحْرُومُونَ Not that we are dalun, we have lost, but we have been deprived. We have been made mahroom. Or the other would be that they themselves realized after a moment, or after a few moments of initial shock, that no, this was our garden and we have been deprived. Okay. قَالَ أَوْسَطُهُمْ Alam أَقُلْ لَكُمْ لَوْ لَا تُسَبِّحُونَ قَالَ أَوْسَطُهُمْ أَوْسَطْ وُسْتَ The middlemost. That the middle, when we talk about middle in, in Islam, that's called the moderate position. Our deen is called deenul wusta. Guard your salah, especially salatul wusta. That everything, you're not extreme right, you're not extreme left, you are a moderate. You are in the middle. You don't go to the edges where you could fall off. So, someone who is 
Awsat, it's considered who is more balanced. So among these brothers or cousins, there was one who was the most moderate, who was, uh, had the best heart from among them. When he saw this, he said to them, did I not? So when they were having that shura, this must have been a person who said, you know, it's not the right thing to do. You know, we shouldn't be greedy. We shouldn't do this. And he said, I told you to do tasbih of Allah, to be in dhikr of Allah. You know, to acknowledge Allah. Because if you are in dhikr of Allah, you're unlikely to make bad choices. That's the importance of constantly being in dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if we get into the habit of constantly being in dhikr, we will find that we are making right choices all the time. It is when we are in ghafla. Because when we are in ghafla, what happens? Now the waswasa of shaitan is coming all the time. And then we start, because of our weaknesses, we start making bad choices, wrong choices. So he reminds them, and what must have happened is because he was one voice, and maybe he was not that strong, he got bowled over by them, and he went along, but now he reminds them. <clears throat> so he says, didn't I tell you that we should have been in dhikr and tasbih of Allah to glorify and sanctify Allah? Giving up dhikr of Allah leads to making bad decisions and choices. And continuous dhikr of Allah grants protection from bad and horrible decisions. Then they realized, they say, Qalu, they all said, Subhana Rabbina, inna kunna zalimeen. Allah, our Lord, is elevated above all blemishes, above all imperfections. That's what Subhana means. Subhanallah means. Anytime they say, like for example, uh, Allah SWT says in the Quran, they say, Qalu Allahu walada. Say, they said Allah has taken a son. What is the next word comes in the Quran? Subhana means Allah is above this imperfection of having a son. Whenever they say something about Allah that is not befitting, our response should be Subhanallah. Said I, I was lying because I was trying to defend Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, in an argument. We should say, Subhana. Allah doesn't require lies. He doesn't require someone to defend him. You know? So that should be that we should always uh, learn that it is us, that we have to constantly be in the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhana inna kunna zalimeen. Now, they did not blame anyone else. This is the beginning of Tawbah. Means you admit your mistake. This is the same thing that the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who? And Yunus alayhi salam, what did he say when he had made a mistake? In the belly, he was always in dhikr, in the belly of the whale, what did he say? Inni kuntu mina zalimeen. What are they saying? Inna kunna zalimeen. He said, mina zalim, among them. They are saying, we are. This is a greater admission. We are the zalim. So they have turned to Allah. فَأَقْبَلَ بَعْضُهُمْ عَلَىٰ بَعْدٍ يَتَلَاوَمُونَ And part of this tawbah was, they started blaming. فَأَقْبَلَ بَعْضُهُمْ عَلَىٰ بَعْدٍ They are arguing with each other. You know, you said this, and you made us do this, and you said this, and you said, no, I didn't say this, and you said this, and why didn't you listen to me, and why didn't you fall? They are arguing with each other, that blame, blame game, as they said, you know, when something goes wrong, any decision is bad, business goes bad, garden gets burned down, you've got to blame somebody. So that went on, and then finally, they accepted the whole blame, that it's all our fault. Yet the moon, you know, blaming each other. <clears throat> now, they have realized, because they were believers, that this is from Allah SWT. The garden was from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. This punishment, if you want to say, or this test that has come, is also a divine act of displeasure. And it's not, sometimes we say, oh, it's, it was a, today we say, natural disaster. You know, the flood came in Bangladesh. You know, or the fire came in California. Can a fire come anywhere without the command of Allah? Can a drop of water, molecule of water move without? Can the wind, the tornado took off this? Can the wind move without the permission of Allah? No. 
So we must remember that in everything there is the hand of Allah. So they ac accepted that, they recognized that, they acknowledged their mistake, they said we have done dhulm and we are indeed transgressors. <coughs> So all of those delusions of wealth and power and intoxication that we have this and we have that is now suddenly gone. And for us, the lesson here is that everything, every decision we make has a consequence in the dunya and in the akhira. Some you see immediately like these people did even before they actually did it just by planning this happened. But it will have consequences. And the greater consequences will come and we'll talk about in the next ayah. They said, Qalu ya waylana inna kunna taagheen. They said, waylana means woe on us. You know, we are taagheen. Taagheen means rebellious. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about taga, ma o taga, and like the flood water exceeded when you talk about Nuh alayhi salam. That we exceeded, we were tyrants, we crossed all bounds of decency, of, of akhlaq by the plans that we were making, you know, of morality and balance. Now, they've acknowledged all of that, then they say, Asa Rabbuna ay yubdilana khairam minha, inna ila rabbina raqibun. Now we have done tawbah, we have Asa Rabbuna, we have hope in our Lord that Allah will replace this burnt thing for us with something better. That's good. We should always have hope in Allah because we make mistakes so you don't become hopeless. Okay? Because Allah tells us that, you know, ya amanu, ya, ya, uh, who have, you know, or you who believe, who have transgressed all bounds, don't lose the hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya asrafu ala anfusihim. Or you who have transgressed out against yourself, la taqnatu min rahmatillah. Do not lose hope in the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, in a way, they are making dua, they are asking for forgiveness, and they are showing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala their uh, hope that Allah will replace it for them. All of this part, second part of this, comes under one word which is called tawbah. This is sincere tawbah. Okay. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, كَذَٰلِكَ الْعَذَابُ وَلَعَذَابُ الْآخِرَةِ أَكْبَرُ لَوْ كَانُوا يَعْلَمُونَ كَذَٰلِكَ الْعَذَابُ This is the way in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards bad decisions, but the adab of the akhira is akbar لَوْ كَانُوا يَعْلَمُونَ That what is going to come. Allah will show you consequences of your action here, but what is coming in the, in the Akhirah, the consequences of a choice, that's the real, you know, both for reward and for punishment. You make good decisions, you make good choices, Allah will reward you. <coughs> he'll give you Sakina, He'll give you honor, He'll give you peace, He'll give you other things here. But what He, what you, what he wants to give you out of His generosity this dimensional world does not have it. The reward isn't there. What Allah wants to give you, that will only be given the Akhira. Because this world doesn't, if He gave you the whole world, it is less than what He wants to give you. Similarly, when we make the bad choices, this world does not have enough punishment because the punishment, whatever you have, you burn, you die. It's not sufficient for what Allah wants to give you, which is an eternal punishment for not you, but the people who do these things in the Akhira. <coughs> so, we have to remember that there is the Akhira, where there is infinite justice. Here everything is limited. The reward is limited, punishment is limited. Sometimes you don't see it. But on the day of infinite justice, when we are told, every atom, dharra, of your good deed will be shown, nothing left. And every dharra of your bad deed will be shown. That is the day of justice. So, <coughs> this, these choices that we make, tawhidi choices, akhlaqi choices, moral choices, business choices, everything will be truly rewarded in the akhara. 
There is a saying, Al Jaza'u min jinsil amal, that the reward is commensurate to the nature of the action. Just remember the full reward cannot be fulfilled in this world because of its current limitations that Allah has made. So I'm going to stop at this because then Allah SWT now goes to the opposite decision of the muttaqin. The next ayah is inna lil muttaqin inda rabbihim jannatin naim. We will go to that next, next time because now Allah SWT is talking about the muttaqin and the, what choices they make and what they reward. The people of taqwa, the people who make the good choices and that's why we should always be screening what is going on inside us of thoughts, of plans, of impulses, of likes, dislikes, drives, anything that is not in compliance with awareness of Allah and His pleasure, we should try and filter out, screen out from. Because Allah likes us to be in that state of consciousness of birr and taqwa and therefore that is what is required from us, that's what we strive for. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us among the muttaqeen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us among the shakkareen who are always grateful to Him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us aware of His bounties while He is giving them to us. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not make us aware of His bounties by taking them away from us. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to learn from well from what we have learned and to screen ourselves, not project this on others for the good qualities and the bad tr traits and to work uh, and make lot of, to correct those and ask sincerely in dua, Ya Allah, show me my traits, my characteristics, my actions, my decisions that you don't like and then give me tawfiq to do tawbah and to change my decisions for future to only those that which you like. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Nashadu an la ilaha illa nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.